Hello, my name is Brian Droitcourt. I'm an editor at Art in America, and I'll be moderating today's conversation with Rafael Lozano Hemmer and Dorothy Santos. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is a time of uncertainty, anger, sadness, and fear for a lot of us. Uh, I know that many art institutions have canceled the programming that they had scheduled this week out of respect for the protesters who are in the streets demanding justice for the black men and women killed by police. Um, and I also believe that silence can be powerful as a, as a way to show respect, but I also think it's important to speak and to talk about injustices and how we can overcome them. And I'm really happy today uh, that Raphael and Dorothy are joining me for this conversation because they have both sought out ways to do that in their art and, uh, and in their writing. So um, I'll introduce today's panelists. Um, Rafael Lozano Hemmer is an artist working with large scale interactive installations. Um, and they often remind us that the future dystopias of science fiction are already here. Uh, many use data um, taken from the bodies of the viewers, not only to generate spectacular multimedia effects, but also to perform critiques of how architecture controls uh, movement and communication. Rafael was the first artist to represent Mexico in the Venice Biennale in 2007, and he has exhibited widely at museums and biennials. He's also um, created several public art projects, uh, including a memorial to the student protesters who were massacred by armed forces in the Tlaloco area of Mexico City in 1968. And uh, last year, he launched a cross-border project connecting um, the cities of El Paso, Texas, and Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, through light and sound. Um, his exhibition, Unstable Presence, opened at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal, where he lives and works in 2018. And it was supposed to open at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art in late April. But of course, um, that has been um, delayed indefinitely because of the museum's closure to, to slow the spread of COVID-19. Um, I originally reached out to Raphael uh, to participate in the series of Zoom talks we're organizing with artists whose shows were canceled due to the pandemic. Uh, so we'll be talking a lot about that show and the works in it, but I'm also really excited to have his perspective on current events. Um, Dorothy Santos is a writer, artist, and educator. She recently contributed a review of Jean Shin's show, Pause, at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco to Art in America. She's also written for Open Space, Rhizome, Ars Technica, and numerous other outlets. She speaks widely on technology and activism, focusing on feminist and queer perspectives on those topics. She's pursuing a PhD in film and digital media at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and works as the program manager at the Processing Foundation, which promotes software literacy in the arts and visual literacy among engineers. Um, I knew that she lives in San Francisco Bay Area, where she was born and raised, and I know she was really excited um, looking forward to Raphael's show. And so I'm also uh, eager to hear what she has to say about that. Um, so just a note on the format, we will be uh, here for an hour until 6 p.m. I'm going to reserve about 10 to 15 minutes for um, audience questions at the end. So if you look at the bottom of the Zoom window, you'll see there is a uh, Q&A button. If you have questions, please type them there and I will be uh, reviewing them and, and selecting questions at the end. Uh, and Dorothy and Raphael can also see the questions and if they, there's something they really wanna speak about, they can also uh, bring that up. So um, I'm going to ask Raphael to sort of walk us through um, Unstable Presence, but first I just wanted to offer uh, Dorothy and Raphael to um, say anything that's on their mind if they wish to. Um, so the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Brian. I'm uh, very excited, thankful to be here. Um, thank you um, to Brian and to Carolina for organizing this. Dorothy, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I was um, just following up on what's going on in uh, the United States. I'm a Mexican Canadian. I live in Canada, uh, but I follow very closely the situation in the United States, which is, of course, um, you know, pretty uh, symptomatic of a larger problem that we have worldwide. 
I was speaking to my wife and she told me, talk about art, not about politics. It's very hard not to talk about politics right now as the US seems to be imploding. The problems that you guys have, of course, are not just your own. There's uh, you know, a set of mob corrupt, disaster capitalist uh, governments going on around the world. We, we call them bracas. Um, and the problems that we are the intensification of adversarial um, discourse of uh, identitarian nationalism, all those things we're hopefully not going to be talking so much about because I think that we're all raw. We're all uh, mourning uh, the, the, the death of George Floyd. Um, and in general, just the idea of, um, of doing this from an art perspective is what I would like to do today, if that's okay. Um, Dorothy, you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. No, thank you so much for that. Um, yes, I have been feeling sad and dismayed and hopeless uh, the past few weeks, trying to think of the ways to even, there are no words for what we're experiencing around the world and in the US. And I think, um, I also just want to take the time to acknowledge that queer, trans, black women of color, women of color, especially have been at the helm of organizing. And I think that is not just here, but globally. And to be able to engage in those conversations, I'll be them, I'll be it, whether they're uncomfortable or not, that's very important to acknowledge. And the last thing I'll say about that, and I, you know, we'll get into this during our discussion, I'm certain, um, because I read a little bit of um, Gloria Sutton's uh, essay on your work and, and kind of how identity is coded, is that um, I, I'm one, even though I've been in the sciences, uh, I don't really believe in objectivity. I think that there is in so many ways um, an agenda and, and, a, and a motivation behind everything. Um, and everything that is nefarious and insidious also has this um, invisibility to it that I kind of want to discuss and why I think your work is so powerful, Raphael. But um, thank you so much for being here, everyone. So if it's okay with everybody, I'll start by sharing my screen because I want to show you um, a little bit about what the show that we just um, show, um, sort of postponed or canceled in SFMOMA was going to be because there's a number of pieces which, um, which are pertinent um, for the contemporary moment. So just to start, say that I work with an incredible team of people here in Montreal. We are um, 15 people, 16 people from uh, seven countries. Um, they're either architects or artists or programmers, engineers. There's a whole bunch of different things. So most of the work that I do is in collaboration with this uh, people who form my studio in Montreal called Antimodular. I myself am Mexican, um, but I have been here uh, in Montreal for the past 15 years. Um, I'll start the presentation with a project called uh, Level of Confidence. And it's in fact talking about police brutality, as you may know, corrupt polit uh, police officers in 2015 kidnapped 43 students from Ayotzinapa, Iguala, in Guerrero. And uh, they were disappeared, but there is no forensic evidence. Their bodies were never found. So the communities in Mexico are still looking for this disappeared students. And so this piece is literally a biometric usage of police and military um, face recognition systems so that when you stand in front of the piece, it analyzes your facial features. It uh, compares you to the database of the images of the 43 students who were education students, 17 to 21 year olds. And it compares you and it sees how close your facial features are to um, a, a particular student. It chooses who looks like you the most and it gives you a level of confidence, like 23%. So the system says you result student not found. So this project is kind of a grim empathy machine designed to constantly look for the students, no matter who goes through, gets um, analyzed and see if we actually uh, get a match for on any of these disappeared students. And this project, we did it, yeah, five years ago here in Montreal. Um, the, the idea is that it's viral, so anybody can download the software from the studio for free and they can put it up. And so far, over 70 universities and 
foundations and libraries and museums in all the areas of Mexico have set this project up to continue reminding us of the loss of these students and also that the search to an extent is a fraternal search that we are to an extent next. Um, we are now going to work with indigenous communities here in Canada to make a version of this work, not to look for the 43 disappeared students of Ayotzinapa, but to look for the over 1,000 women, indigenous women that have disappeared in the past 10 years here in Canada. So the idea is this project is, it can be used for other searches of missing people. It's called Level of Confidence. Um, another project that will has been at, at Unstable Presence is called Zoom Pavilion. It's a collaboration with Polish artist Krzysztof Wodyszko, an artist that I admire greatly um, for his ethics, for his work in public space. And one thing that he was telling me is when he was young in communist Poland, it was actually forbidden for three or more people to meet in public space without a permit. So what this piece does is it tracks not individuals, but relationships between individuals. So as you walk in the room, the system completely uh, calculates how far away you are from others, and it logs that in, telling you not only who you were with, but how far away you were from them and for how long. So this archive of relationships of space inside of the supposedly neutral space that is the museum becomes at, at once violent and uncanny and Orwellian, but then also a commentary on the, the culture of selfies and of participation of reality TV. So the project um, has been presented um, you know, in, in both in Montreal and in the version in Monterrey, which is the one that just closed and then hopefully at SFMOMA at some point. Um, not all works are, are surveillance-based. This one, for example, is w one piece of several that is involved with the notion of, of investigating the atmosphere. How can we create pieces that help us uh, breathe and visualize this breathing? So this is uh, a fountain that generates a poetry selected uh, fragments of the poetry of Octavio Paz, the Mexican poet, and it writes them with water, with ultrasonic atomizers. So as you come in, you, um, you look at the water basin and it starts writing the poetry of Octavio Paz with cold water vapor. And Octavio Paz spoke about the moment how when poetry is, is spoken, declaimed, it becomes the atmosphere and it can be breathed by other people. So this piece is called uh, Call on Water. And it's slow, but it's this kind of mesmerizing representation of this poetry. Another work in SF MoMA is um, called um, Sphere Packing Bach. And it's basically a room where there's 1,128 speakers pointed at your brain. Each one of these speakers has a different composition by Johann Sebastian Bach. So the totality of Bach's work is firing um, from this um, circle. And even if you move a little bit, you get a different kind of cacophony. And so this work is this uh, compression, let's say, of his work's life into a system um, that creates this, this, you know, sort of cacophonic universe um, to, to complicate the, the, the perception of sound. The project is made with 11 kilometers of cable. So you'll see the back room. Um, and um, it's, it's a massively parallel um, sort of sound engine powered by these kinds of eclipses that you see which control, which speakers are turned off and on. Uh, sorry, the reason I'm going through the SFMOMA show is because Brian mentioned that it would be good to give context of what people in, 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 you know, will, will see when this show is finally um, on. So one of the things I'm fascinated about, as I was saying, is the idea that as we speak, we generate a turbulence. And then that turbulence has been in the history of art uh, represented by different uh, kinds of precedents. And I wanted to see, well, what was the shape of those uh, volutes, those emissions? Uh, in Spanish, we say alito. It's the breath that comes out as you speak. So we work with NYU, Georgia Tech, and Auburn University to create a system of um, of, of uh, laser tomography so that when you speak, we could actually take slices of your breath and create this kind of animation 
that basically tells the computer what's the shape of the breath of your voice. And then we take these slices of, of air and we use photogrammetry to create a 3D model and then we print it in 3D. So this is the world's first 3D printed speech bubble. And this is printed in steel. Um, I really like that it's the size of, of your hand. So your word is almost like a projectile. And, uh, and we are now more and more doing this kind of sculptural renditions of fluid dynamics, because even if the same person said the same thing, the shape would be completely different. So the first sentence that we 3D printed is Au clair de la lune. And it's this little sculpture that you see here. It's also, uh, this one's printed in aluminum. And the next one we're going to do is a massive commission uh, that Mexico um, is gifting the National Gallery of Canada. It's a homage to R. Murray Schaefer, who is the um, Canadian composer. He's kind of like the John Cage of Canada. He talked about soundscapes, he coined that term. And it's all about the idea that the atmosphere is not um, you know, neutral, that, that is never silent, the deep listening. So he said, listen to the world. So we will take those words, listen to the world and create a unique three-dimensional representation of these words. Going uh, ahead with this sort of atmospheric um, interest, this is Pauline Oliveros, also part of Deep Listening. And this incredible pioneering composer and accordionist who worked in San Francisco a lot, um, we asked her to breathe into this brown paper bag. And then we um, hooked up the brown paper bag to a bespoke respirator which makes her breath go in and out of the brown paper bag 10,000 times a day, like the normal respiratory frequency for an adult at rest. And the idea with this project, which is kind of perverse, um, is it's kind of like a biometric portrait of Pauline Oliveros, who herself worked with Bellows in her, in her accordion. Um, and so she sadly passed away about three years ago. And so if you want to see the last breath of Pauline Oliveros, you can go and see this at, as part of SFMOMA's collection. Similar to this project, um, it's a sort of kind of grander version of it. It's called Vicious Circular Breathing. And this project is um, a massive hermetically sealed chamber that invites the public to go in and breathe the air that has already been breathed by everybody before you. So as you walk in, there's a, de um, a decompression chamber, all the clean air leaves, and then you're led into this big cabin where you're breathing the viruses, bacteria, pheromones, all airborne pollutants of the previous people who visited the piece. So it's quite disgusting. I did not intend for people to go in it. I thought it would just be a conceptual work, but all the times we've shown this work, which was commissioned by Borussia in, in, in Istanbul, there's a lineup of people trying to go in. As you breathe, your air leaves through a series of bellows and, uh, and uh, tubing that inflate and deflate 61 brown paper bags to kind of make material the, the presence of this communal air. In this piece, participation is put to the test. As you know, people like myself who work with new media or, or media art, we're always talking about participation as something very positive that will give you empowerment and agency. However, in this project, if you participate too long, you die. Um, crucially, your participation makes the air more toxic for future participants. So I really want to complicate this idea of participation as something positive and also to think about the commons, right? The air we breathe, the water we drink, the ground we're in, who has access to this bubble, right? And is basically, we're like the bubble boys, 7.7 .7 billion people are sharing an atmosphere and our presence is itself the virus, it's itself the contagion. So I'm pretty sure that after COVID, this work will not be presented for a good like four or five years. Um, I never went into the piece. Actually, I was the first person to go in when it was clean, but then I refused to go in. And there's massive warnings for contagion, panic, and asphyxiation. Um, another work uh, that is in the, in the Unstable Presence show is these uh, two million nano pamphlets. They're engraved with the words of Charles Babbage, who in 1837 said that the air was a massive library that stored all the words of people who have spoken in the past. And so these little flakes of gold are exhibited in the show, but before the show opens, 
I actually release about 200,000 of them into the air conditioning system of the museum so that people breathe the texts of Charles Babbage. That's, those are selections from Unstable Presence, which is that exhibition that, um, that is supposed to be at SF MoMA now. But about half of the practice of my studio is in public art. And um, for, I mean, as I'm a Mexican immigrant in Canada, but I have for a long time admired the work of artists who have worked across the US-Mexico border. And as soon as uh, Trump got elected, I wanted to create a piece that would underline the connection that is already existing between the sister cities of Ciudad Juarez in Chihuahua and El Paso, Texas. So you have on the left, that's Mexico, and on the right, that's the US, that's Texas. And what we would do is despite the building of walls and the adversarial uh, discourse of separation, what we wanted to do is create these bridges of light through which people could speak to each other across the US-Mexico border using massive, uh, powerful searchlights that could be seen from a 10 mile radius. So during this project, what we did is uh, we placed three interactive stations in the US and three in Mexico. And then in between is the Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo, and the wall. And then what we did is in each station, we had um, these interfaces, which had this tuning wheel that allowed you to control searchlights and scan the horizon across the border. And when my light and your light were intersected, automatically the system would open a bi-directional channel of communication between the two people. And as you spoke, the light would blink to the frequency and volume of your voice. And if you didn't like what the other person on the other side was saying, you could just tune them out and look for somebody else. So it was a way to get control of, of the narrative and create an interface that was more about listening rather than one for speaking. So the piece um, controlled these uh, robot arms and I have some footage showing you what the piece actually looked for, looked like. This was commissioned by um, UTEP's uh, Rubin Center for the Arts. And uh, in Mexico, uh, we worked with a great, we work, we're great ¿Sabes with- que yo soy de Juárez y ahora uh, vivo en El Paso. Yes. Y mucho I'll let Juárez. you- um, Yo soy de allá también. Listen for a little wow, bit. Wow, qué coincidencia, oye. Oye, pues ahora estamos conectados con esta luz que nos proyecta aquí en un cielo que nos cubre Juárez el Paso. Sí. Um, oh, ¿Y no. usted viene a Juárez? Um, when I was young, I did, but it's been 10 years. I used to go on the weekends in high school. We'd go to the downtown and to the bars and everything. That's fun. But not anymore. I'm afraid now. So these two ladies are talking about the Walmart killings and about who's more scared. Um, so these uh, ladies don't know each other. They just meet through the microphone and they tune each other and establish conversations. Um, it, it, it got very um, emotional. There's a lot of separation. There's families, about 70% of the people in the area have family members on the other side. I'm sorry, it's quite violent to, to quiet people down. Uh, this man actually works for the government and he's not allowed to go into Mexico even though he's got family there. Um, this young lady in Ciudad Juarez uh, is talking to this gentleman about how to learn Spanish. You had everything from people who are missing uh, family members to uh, flirting, uh, to dedications. This man, for example, is a veteran of the Vietnam War. He's Mexican and he was deported. So he's talking about how horrible it is to have fought for a country and then be deported. Um, we had uh, indigenous communities. This is the mayor of El Paso speaking. 
um, talking about how this uh, division wrongs them. Um, so it, it was it was a, a place a piece that was out of control, where people could say anything they wanted, unmoderated and uncensored. And it wasn't all sad. Like, uh, like I said, there was a lot of flirting. There was a lot of serenades. So I think in the next video I have like, this is, um, this is Batallones Femeninos. Um, this is Batallones Femeninos, who's like a great um, rapper in Ciudad Juarez. And she's singing um, with Adelitas Fronterizas on the other side. So there's, there's hours and hours of material of just people speaking across the, the, the border. And for me, this kind of artwork is about the creation of, of um, a visible um, manifestation of that interaction that exists between the sister cities and how the media never really report the complexity of the region. You only hear about the border, about, about violence and about death and so on. And while all those things are true, it's also a, an area of intense community, a uh, sense of, of historical connection, economic connection, of, um, you know, atmospheric or, or, or um, uh, medio ambiente, como se dice medio ambiente? Um, atmos uh, what? Environmental connection and so on. So that's the project. I you could also, um, sort of see each other through an app, like through uh, your phone. And um, yeah, the most important thing for me in this public art project is the idea that um, the project is out of my control, that uh, this is a platform for people to self-represent. And I believe very much that public art has a role to play in this kind of, um, in this moment, you know, in a moment of division and, and racism. Um, the final project I'll show you is during this, we developed another project called uh, Remote Pulse. So this is me, I'm in Texas, and I put my hands onto this plate, and this little light is actually my heartbeat. So it's picking it up uh, just with uh, a sensor similar to what you might find at a gym. But my heartbeat is being sent electronically, electro uh, electronically to Mexico, where there's an ad uh, another station that is identical. So if someone in Mexico touches their uh, copy, the second light lights up and I start feeling their heartbeat in my hands. So there's little vibrators underneath the sensor. So you are basically feeling their heart and they're feeling yours. And this piece, even more than border tuner, generated a lot of, of, of um, emotion because like I said, there's a lot of uh, separation in the, in the area. And, um, and it's, it's very intimate. You put your hands on the, it's almost like you put your hands on the chest of the person on the other side. So this project was donated to the cities so that um, they can set them up permanently and people will always be able to touch the heart of the person on the other side of the border. So this is two people participating. That's Kerry Doyle, the US curator of the project. Um, Leon de la Rosa was a curator on the Mexican side. Edgar Merino, Edgar Picasso, sorry, um, was also doing a lot of special events like concerts and, and poets uh, and uh, literature events and so on. So that's called Remote Pulse. And that's, that's what I wanted to show you. I'll stop. Thank you so and, much. I think um, it's a really valuable introduction for, for those people who are joining us who might not be familiar with your work. Um, it's also really interesting to think about how the experience of living in, in a pandemic is going to sensitize viewers to some of the topics that you're, you've been working with, which might not otherwise be readily apparent. I mean, I feel like Border Tuner, besides everything it, it, it says about the border and, and life near the border and the communities around it, um, is also saying some really powerful things about remote communication um, and contact between strangers who can't necessarily see each other. Um, and just seeing those 3D printed speech bubbles um, that are printed in al aluminum, I, I, it just made me think about how we're, we're now so aware of the vapors and the breath that is coming out of our mouths. This, this idea of like the distance of six feet that is sort of um, creating an awareness of, of how our breath travels and the kind of space that it takes up. Um, now, I, I was also interested to hear you say that, that vicious circular breathing um, 
was not intended to be interactive, but it kind of took on that, that quality. Uh, and I was sort of curious because I, I saw your show Pulse at the Hirschhorn Museum last year, and that had three large in, uh, installations that were interactive that, um, I, as I recall, required audiences to touch sensors like, like in the Pulse work. And so I'm just wondering if you thought about how um, making interact, making and displaying interactive artwork is going to change now that people are more sensitive to uh, contagion. I, I mean, yes, definitely. There's a practical side to this, which is how do you measure people's heartbeats? So we have a project at the studio now is going to be called On Pulse because we've been working with the heartbeat for a very long time. And there is a new technique called photoplethysmography, which is literally um, measuring your heartbeat, looking at you with your webcam. The computer can detect tiny little variations in the skin color and detect your heartbeat quite accurately. So we're making an artwork which will be online and in the future um, with the camera, with your webcam, we can extract your heartbeat. And so that's what, what we may need to do in a contactless world. But that's a practical level. At the more important level, which is the symbolic level or the philosophical level, I think that an awareness of the atmosphere is the single most interesting development with COVID, right? Like um, it seemed like climate change and the extinction event that we're under was not capturing the, the attention of the media and the politicians and, and everybody. Now we can talk about flattening the curve, for example. So maybe we can take that language and apply it to climate change. Uh, or the other thing that I was thinking is pretty much all the philosophers that I like, like Akila Membe or um, Bifo Velardi, I mean, they're all talking about the atmosphere as this new site to understand the, the challenges that we have. If if you think of COVID as globalization trying to kill us, um, I think that there's something about that that is going to be very healthy because the idea of the global village and all of this kind of tired white male ideas that are colonial are disappearing in the air. In the air. And I think that Eric Gardner and George Floyd's like statement, I can't breathe, is the single most important slogan of our time. So we don't we can't take for granted this air that at one point is private, is inside of us, and then it becomes public. And so this idea of a relationship of, of interdependence with, with the air, I think is gonna be a really healthy thing um, to, to be aware of and, and, to, and to treasure really, because we are under, we're, we're, we're breathing air at 412 parts per million of carbon dioxide. No human ever in the history of humankind ever uh, breathes so much carbon dioxide. And so how do you make that tangible? How do you use art to show the ways in which freedom of speech is being curtailed and, you know, your, free, your freedom to breathe is being curtailed? And then, um, you know, I think that I'm not, I'm not new in this. I mean, I, there's a lot of people who have worked in this, in this fashion, but I'm really curious about how we can think about the atmosphere as something that is uh, very pertinent today. Yeah, no, I, I mean, related to everything you're talking about, Raphael, I think one of the biggest things uh, that I, I've taken away, and obviously for folks that don't know, I, um, I, my master's thesis is actually on Raphael's work. My first chapter was on uh, his work, Frequency and Volume. And I think one of the things that I wanted to point out that you're talking about is also scale. I think your practice actually helps us uh, understand scale. There's so many things that we can't understand in the billions and trillions, and it's not... And I'm not talking about visualization. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this uh, manifestation in this very tangible sense and form of what you're you're actually speaking to. I really love the piece of um, the um, you know uh, using Octavio Paz's uh, poetry. But one of the things I wanted to ask was actually about it came up in you know um, the writing that's been done about your work and, and and the way that it's been described as kind of this co-presence and presencing of asymmetrical relationships then I mean I'm actually um, looking at some of the text here and I, I'm kind of curious how you know related to scale and I'm asking this mostly in, in terms of surveillance um, how have people kind of interpreted you know, a lot of your work being, and I come from, and I work within the open source kind of community, 
have felt about the surveillance factor of of the projects you know they're downloadable they're they're you know there's an ability to kind of um uh, you know, uh, install these these softwares and platforms in one's own city and region. But how have you you contended with sur uh, issues of surveillance, issues of privacy when that has come up? Um, the most important sort of answer is like I, I really take to heart Manuel de Landa's idea that our prejudices are embedded into the technologies that we use. So whenever I am using a technology such as Zoom, I am aware of the fact that these are the mechanisms through which control um, is taking place in an unprecedented way. Um, the internet itself developed by, by the Pentagon uh, and, and, and that these kinds of lack of neutrality you know, re remain um, contestable. So I, I, for example, have noted that most people when finding a surveillance camera or a surveillance piece like some of that I showed you, they will either, either say, well, this is Orwellian and dystopian, or they'll say, oh, this is playful and, you know, it's like a Snapchat thing. Now, in between play and violence is where my work happens. It's, it's right at the border of the seduction of participation, but then also the ominous um, sort of society of metrics that gets represented. Um, I think, I, I, because I was following closely how face recognition is being used, there's a great artist uh, in LA, Carl McDonald, who is you know, very interested, for example, to um, create surveillance systems that can be used, say, in protests, but that anonymize, an, anonymize people. So this is, this is fascinating. You know, how, how can we misuse technologies of, of control um, to create connective or, or um, how do you say in English, um, um, ma manifestations of, of, of you being present? Um, so I said that face recognition needs to be banned in all applications except art, <laughs> because I think that art, art, art has a contribution to make um, to face recognition. Otherwise, it should be it should be banned. No, absolutely. I think also just to note of similar on the on the other coast is Everest Pitkin, who recently they made um, uh, and that they, they created a couple of platforms and softwares that you're able to kind of blur the images um, in, you know, from protests uh, and then scrub data in that sense. But I just wanted to mention that. Brian, did you want to say something before I go on? Uh, you, you can finish your thought. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm done. Please go. go. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just thinking when you were showing um, these works level of confidence and, and Zoom Pavilion, I mean, when you are creating an installation, I mean, do you think about um, how you sort of get from reproducing uh, systems of surveillance to critiquing them. I mean, I think this is always the danger of artists who are working these, with these technologies is, you know, um, how, how do you sort of clarify and, and make the statement that you're kind of addressing a problem? I mean, I think there's always going to be the audience who is going to have fun with it and take us Selfie and and that's great, but I, I kind of wondering how you have um, considered that problem in your work and how you try to um, make your position clear. Mm. So I mean, I started working with technology uh, in theater. Really, I mean, I was surrounded by choreographers and actors and writers and musicians, and I had no talent, so I just became the director and kind of helped people move around. But I did. I have a chemistry degree, and I did at the time know how to program. So I programmed a massive eye that would follow um, the performers. And at the end of the performance, we would invite the public to come in and walk around the stage and see that the eye really did follow them. This is in 1992. Um, I started with that technology as a way to um, make evident this systems of, of surveillance. The idea um, in terms of art is this idea that the artworks are seeing you, they're listening to you, they feel you. And it is the artworks that are expecting the public to introduce the, the you know, do something interesting with them. So there's a little reversal of how we think about artworks. Artworks have agency and they have this perception and this capabilities. But for me, what's important in, in this kind of projects is to always contribute something. I think that, for example, on, this, on the fact of Zoom Pavilion, the fact that we went through the playbook of communist policing and we articulated that as a fundamental part 
of the surveillance system. We're making tangible those systems which back in the day um, were in place, and no doubt they're still in place in some places, um, is, is, is our contribution. Our contribution is to take this moment of history and then make it tangible in a, in a place which some people will think is critical. Uh, but I have no doubt that I am complicit with what I denounce, right? I, I denounce a society of metrics and I cannot feel objective, like uh, Dorothy was saying before, the objectivity is not there. I'm part of the problem. And these technologies I see as the natural occurrence of, you know, our environment today. So, so to use these technologies as the normal or the natural sort of approach. The only thing I hope is that my application is perverting the original uses for which they were intended. Perverting is the right word? Yeah, perverting. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, oh gosh, we, only, we don't even have that much time and I have so much to share and say, but I think one of the things you, I, and, and Rafael, please, uh, you were presenting on um, the Ayosanapa, the uh, level of confidence and I think, and I have seen that piece. And I think one of the things I, I couldn't, I, I, the thing is, it's really interesting how people, cause I've seen, I've seen people, I've seen this online where people are like, programming, not politics. I mean, trust me, I've, I've seen this, I've read it. <laughs> and uh, people have said, um, just focus on that. And, and, you know, and, and you can't, it, 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 it's, it's, it's almost impossible. And I think the reason why I say this is there was a, a Dalit rights activist, uh, the Mozi Sandar Ravajan, who actually mentioned this idea of um, her concern actually isn't this, this idea of empathy. It's actually the privileging because there's also an understanding that your able-bodiedness enables you to be out in the world. I think that's one of the reasons why there's a kind of power in the level of confidence in that piece in particular where it's almost this um this and en this endless gaze that is very painful and you know in, in in i was wondering in terms of um i don't know how to ask this very difficult question what if there was a match what if what if there was uh this this relationship to that where a body matched a body uh you know within within a piece of a human being and how have you contended with that that speculation Thanks so much for that question. I mean, it's a very complicated piece, so much so that I don't even think of it as an artwork, right? Because I think that there is a real problem with all of a sudden taking these images and putting them as an object. So a couple of really important notes. The first one is that this piece is, um, it, it's a constant search, but it happens inside the privilege of being able to have a computer and a webcam and a display, which has to be supplied by them. A lot of my friends were saying to me, the activist friends are saying, Rafael, if you want to do something about the situation, you need to come here in the field. The reality is I'm not that guy. I'm a nerd guy who lives in Canada, but I still am a citizen. So I feel that as a citizen, somebody who works with um, face recognition technologies, this is the contribution that I could do. So uh, on the subject of the match, one of the things that happened to us is in one of the caravans of the parents of the Yotinapa uh, students, one woman went in there and she got a 93% match. And it was one of the mothers of one of the students. And I, I, I swear, like everybody just started crying. And there was this, this sort of fraternal connection that you could see through the face recognition. And, and it was a very important moment in this piece. Here's, here's something that really matters about it. That project, anytime that it's exhibited or anytime that it's, it's actually been acquired by a couple of collections, the entirety of the money has been directed to the parents uh, of, the, of the disappeared students. So we've actually generated you know, tens of thousands of dollars for them to get you know, lawyers and their own forensic experts and whatever. So I am aware of the privilege that I have in, even empathy is the wrong word. It's more like commiseration or, or a sense, because empathy is already like asymmetric. So you, don't, you wanna sort of not talk so much about that. You wanna talk about, you know, we, you are standing in front, you don't want to forget that they're lost and that we're still looking for them. So you wanna keep them current. You wanna generate income for them because that's what they need. They need money right now. And then you want to also, you know, have a question for the public, you know, like to what degree are you complicit with what's happening here and how does this technology apply to you? And so I'm hoping that all those levels 
don't make this work perfect. I, I have a lot of problems with artists such as myself that from our privilege, we speak, you know, about like the difficulties or hardships of other communities. Um, but, but I think that that shouldn't stop us. We should still try to do something, you know, and, um, and then try not to profit from it. Um, I, somebody said, well, you should have gone anonymous with it. But had I gone anonymous with it, it might not have entered as many, you know, sort of uh, museums and schools and so on as it ended up being. So it's not perfect, but, but it's a really good question that you have. It's like, I'm aware of that privilege, but I still got to do something about it because um, I'm, you know, yeah, that's it. It's because I'm a citizen. Thanks so much for that. Um, there is so much to talk about and we're already... <laughs> 50 minutes from the end. I wanted to um, go to the some of the questions that were asked. Um, Raphael, I was interested to hear about you talking about your early work in theater tech, because one of the questions we got was how you got started, um, how it became possible for you to use tech. I mean, now you have this huge studio of all of these specialists, but of course, you know, you probably couldn't start it out this way. So I think it, it, I am kind of curious also like, like this um, attendee about how you got your start making th this kind of work. So I did, so right after graduating from chemistry here in Canada, we have the Canada Council for the Arts, which is kind of like your NEA, but well-funded and, um, and neutral. And, and so they, I said, listen, I'm 20 years old and I want to do technological theater with this bunch of friends. And they gave me an initial grant to help me do that. And so I grabbed my $500 a month, quit some of my jobs, and then started doing technological theater. This lasted for, I don't know, maybe say three or four years in the performing arts. And then when we noticed that some of the stage design that I was making, like this eye that followed people, could stand on its own, that it could become an artwork that somebody could see in a museum, um, I started my art career as a visual artist, even though I still consider myself closer to the performing arts than the visual arts. And then slowly, I mean, I supported myself making websites, basically, and conferences. Um, and eventually, what, what took off was the public art. So I started making large-scale projection works that were interactive. Um, and, um, and for about 10 years, I bad-mouthed the entire art market, calling it necrophiliac and vampiric. And then now I am represented by several galleries. And so I changed my tune. And uh, now about 50% of the work is, you know, sort of pieces for museums or collectors or biennials. And 50% remains this kind of more performative, ephemeral public art piece. Yeah, I, I think what you were saying about uh, understanding the art as um, feeling and seeing and hearing the audience, um, understanding how that comes out of your, your work in theater um, it, it is super interesting. Um, another kind of like practical question was about border tuner of remote, remote pulse. Uh, were those commissioned by the cities and curated by each cities? I mean, I, and I think this is also an interesting question because it gets us how you sort of work. Um, yeah you know, sort, sort of between cultures and between, uh, you know, political entities. Yeah, so that project, um, first of all, I, I, I had an idea, like an idea for 15 years of what I wanted to do at the border. And then I met Kerry Doyle, the curator from the Rubin Center for the Arts, and I, she invited me to come to El Paso en Juarez and we toured it. I met local artists, uh, people like Alejandro Luperca Morales or people like Jane Terrazas. And, and I realized there's, A, there's already an incredible art scene in El Paso en Ciudad Juarez that is un, unrecognized or underrecognized. Um, secondly, I realized that everything that I had thought I wanted to do at the border was wrong. And so the piece uh, kind of emerged from dialogue with these artists. I went eight times to the region. I realized that the work of many artists arrives at the border as some kind of UFO, and I wanted to avoid that. So what we did is we had Leon de la Rosa, who is a Mexican curator, do the Mexican side, Carrie Doyle do the US side, and Edgar Picasso do the, the special programs. 
And what we did is we tried to find, all, we succeeded in finding all the funding through philanthropic organizations. So the Mellon Foundation gave us uh, support, the Via Art Fund gave us support, Arte Abierto in Mexico gave us support, um, Bloomberg Philanthropies gave us support, and so on. And so the most important aspect of this support to put this project in is that we didn't want governments to be involved. And we didn't want like big corporate logos making this into some kind of Instagrammable Grand Prix. Um, and that was the most difficult part of this project. It wasn't the permits. It wasn't the desire for people to participate. It wasn't the fact that those lights at the border are associated with La Migra looking for migrants, right? So there's all this violence and all these problems in the region. The biggest problem was how to find funding it wasn't completely clean, nothing is perfectly clean, but to the best of our ability to make it into a platform, a civic platform, where people felt that they could self-represent. So there are some more questions about border tuner. Uh, one is about um, just kind of the use of the searchlight across a range of your public works. Yeah, so, well, I've been using Searchlight since 1999. I made a massive project in the Zocalo in, in Mexico City where people would produce um, light sculptures from their home or work or study. Um, and these light sculptures would last for eight seconds. We would document them and create a web page for each participant. And um, the Searchlights, obviously, they come from a you know, and when we think of them, we think of Albert Speer, or we think of anti-aircraft surveillance, we think of war, um, but they come from a lot earlier, right? So they were uh, invented in the late 19th century, and they were used at World Expos to sort of signal this new electricity that signaled the arrival of modernity, right? And so these searchlights took on a militaristic view, of course, and then after the the Second World War, they were used for victory parades. So oftentimes now when we see the searchlights, we think of the opening of a new shopping mall or something like that. Um, and I wanted to take on these, these lights and I, want, I wanted to invert the power mechanism of them. Normally in an Albert Speer piece, the media controls the people and the people are just props in the fascist spectacle. What I wanna do is I want, whenever I use these searchlights, I use them so that they're controlled from the bottom up. And the, it's quite in a region like the border, where, as I said, you have these motherfuckers, what were they called, the Minutemen, and all these other groups that would bring on searchlights to look for migrants. Oh shit, did I just swear? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, those, those, the, 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 the kind of legacy of these lights you know, brings us back to that kind of predatorial usage of the light of interrogation, right? So I work a lot with light. And I've said, while I admire people like James Turrell, for example, in this kind of Quaker search for the interior light, I'm more interested in the light of interrogation, the light that blinds you, right? The, 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 the power and the violence of that light is not lost in a place like the border. But then juxtaposed with the discussions and with the visualization of the dialogue, I think it makes them into something else, or at least I hope, I, I, I think it worked. Sorry, I just have to say that I think this just goes back to my kind of fixation on the point of scale. That, yeah. you know, that, that light, like you have to make something kind of, you have to make a grandiose gesture in order for people to really get a sensation and an embodied experience of kind of the gravity of the situation that, you, um, that you're addressing in your work. Sorry, I just have to. Although I, I have to say there's an artist called Ivan Abreu, he's a Mexican Cuban artist and he did a great piece with Carrie. And it was like the simplest thing in the world. It was like a little, um, how do you say in English, a level, like a bubble level. And he would take like, for example, the oldest person in El Paso and the oldest person in Ciudad Juarez, and they would hold the level across the fence and just try to put the bubble in the right, in the right thing. And then he would bring like a feminist and another feminist, and they would like both try and level it. And then they bring the police chief and they would do, level it. So with like 75 cents worth of, of gear, he made a piece that is superior to mine in many, many ways. So I always defend, you know, the, the economy and the, and the um, sort of, um, you, you know, my pieces are, they're, they're a bit obscene. They're, you know, it's a big problem to bring these searchlights, which are usually used in Olympic celebrations or Paul McCartney shows or whatever, and spend all of that money in a region that needs this funds, you know, so it, it, they're in a very dire state. One of the things we did is we actually took part of the budget of Border Tuner and we created, um, or they created, 
um, a trans border um, support fund for future artists in the region to make binational works. So whenever I'm in a place like that, I, I, I try my best to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, I come from abroad with a sense of prejudices and I'm applying them. What was the name of that artist again, Rafael? Sorry. Ivan Abreu. He's amazing. Everything he does is incredible. And there's so many. I mean, the, the artists who have worked across the U.S.-Mexico border have made such important works, in my opinion. And I, I, I'm going to say something, my wife will kill me, but um, this is sometimes I think, you know, during the Spanish Civil War, all the intellectuals went to Spain, right? You had like Camus was there and Orwell was there and George Sand was there. And they're like, fascism is coming. Let's go into Spain and be there, part of this moment. And I think, you know, when I have grandchildren, I want to turn around and when they say, hey, grandpa, what did you do when fascism was taking over the United States? I know it's not fascism, it's a new thing. But I want to say, well, this is what I tried. You know, here's, I, I tried to show the interconnection of these two sister cities. And um, I just feel that artists, that, that, that we are right now either fighting this or, or we're complicit with and enabling, um, you know, extremely dangerous, um, you know, sort of politics. And uh, I know you guys all know that, but I'm just saying, you know, it, it needs to be applied. How, how can artists be uh, useful? In a, in a time like this. Dorothy, do you have any um, final thoughts before we wrap up? No, Rafael, Brian, this is way too short. I have to say <laughs> there's so much to talk about. And Rafael, thank you so much for your generosity, but also just thank you. Thank you for your generosity and spirit, the practice, but also enlightening us on kind of the, the complexities and the nuances, but also like the challenging aspects of, of what you been grappling so thank you and thank you brian thank you yeah i'd just like to echo dorothy i mean i think there is so much care in your work and that is really important so thank you for what you do and um thanks everyone for joining us today i think there's some people giving last minute questions but um oh wow have to end but um just so everyone knows there will be recordings of this available on our uh, Instagram and YouTube channels. I would like to say if, if people want to read more about the technology behind Border Tuner, go to bordertuner.net, which is the website for the project where you'll find lots of information on it. Thank you. Muchas gracias. <laughs>